guess what time it is? Time to travel through the word. So let's see what we talked about last week. Last week we had Jeremiah 27 through 34, and then we had 37 through 39 and chapter 52. We had 2 Kings 24 through 25, 2 Chronicles 36. We had Psalm 79 and 126. And then for New Testament, we had James 4 through 5 and 1 Peter 1 through 3. So for our Jeremiah, starting with verse 27, um, Jeremiah is still prophesying about what's about to happen to Judah because, you know, they've been disobedient and acting all crazy. So Jeremiah, uh, God tells Jeremiah to put on this yoke. And so Jeremiah uh, places the yoke on them and he prophesies to them that that's what's about to happen to them. Like God's about to put a yoke on them um, for their disobedience. And they were going to be carried off to Babylon, um, but they would live there. And so uh, Jeremiah also gave a warning to Zedekiah, who was the king of Judah. So Hananiah, who was a false prophet, was lying about, you know, it's going to be peace and restoration. This thing is going to last two years. Don't even worry about it. Okay, so guess what? Zedekiah was putting his faith in the false prophet. Bless his heart. So then we get to chapter 28. And we talk about Hananiah's false prophecy, Jeremiah's response to it. Hananiah breaks Jeremiah's yoke and then the Lord's word against Hananiah. So Hananiah was prophesying a prosperity, you know, gospel with restoration. It was going to go, this thing was only going to last for two years. Every people that All the things that were carried away were going to get brought back. And so Jeremiah basically says to Hananiah, I mean, yeah, to Hananiah, well, you know what? A prophet is known by the truth that comes from his prophecy. So let's just wait and see. That's what he was basically saying. I can show you better than I can tell you. That's what my grandmother used to say. And so uh, Hananiah breaks the yoke off Jeremiah and then basically says, this is what God's going to do to the Babylonians. Going to break the yoke off so he can break the yoke of what Babylonia is trying to do to you. He's going to break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylonia. Bless his little heart. Well, God responded that I put an iron yoke on all the nations, including the animals. That's the kind of God he was. And then he added that, guess what? Hannah and I, you're going to die before the year's over. And guess what? The seventh month of that year, Hannah and I died. So then we get to Jeremiah 29 and Jeremiah, they, you know, sends a letter to the exile. So you can kind of tell how this is kind of, you know, out of order a little bit. And he, basically Jeremiah tells them, hey, y'all need to just establish a kingdom presence there. Build houses, be industrious, do the stuff that you're supposed to do because you're not coming back soon. You're going to be there for a while. So let's make the best of it. Let's give God some glory and let's do what we got to do. Okay. He said, go out into the culture and do what? Love your neighbors. All right. Show show the people around you who God is. So that's what that was. And so chapter 30, uh, Jeremiah talks about a restoration from captivity, healing Zion, Zion's wounds and then a restoration of the land. So he was speaking about, you know, how they were going to come back. And he was also speaking about when Christ was going to return. And then he reminds us in chapter 30, what's impossible for man is possible with God. Zion would be healed. Okay. Chapter 31, God talks about his relationship with his people. Okay. God bringing the people home, a lament turned to joy, repentance and restoration, the new covenant. And so they give an analogy uh, of Rachel weeping for her children. Okay. Because it's, it's like symbolic of what was happening to them. Okay. And then it turns around and says, but guess what? Your grief is going to one day be turned to joy. The blessings of the Mosaic covenant. That's what the people were living under the Mosaic covenant. Those blessings that were attached to that were conditioned on Israel's obedience. Right. And guess what? Israel failed to keep their side. They didn't do right. And so the law revealed their sinfulness and their inability to obey. So for me, I said, Lord, remind me that God promised a new relationship with him that would be so rich and dynamic that he would write his teaching on our hearts. Isn't that beautiful? And I said, my question for you is, you do know when God makes a covenant with you, it's always conditioned on your obedience. 
It just is. Then we get to Jeremiah 32, and Jeremiah makes this land purchase. So God basically is telling Jeremiah, which he uses Zedekiah to do it. But he says, go purchase land. Now, I know I'm about to carry everybody off to Babylon, Babylon, and um, but I want you to purchase a land because it was significant of the future. They were coming back. Okay? They, were, they would return in the future. And then you had Jeremiah 33, talked about Israel's restoration and God's covenant with David. And so a lot of times when they use tree imagery to speak, uh, they were talking about um, how the Messiah would rise from the lineage of David. Okay. So it was like a tree, like branches of the tree always, because you were going to come up from that lineage. But here's the, here's the thing to remember. God never did promise an unbroken monarchy. Right? So, you know, even though he was going to stop it, but Jesus was going to come through and it was going to be, there we go. So, uh, it was a reminder that Jesus was to run true heir to the throne of David and he would be our priest forever. And then you get to chapter 34. Uh, Jeremiah sends a word to King Zedekiah. And it talks about the people and their slaves. Now, this is what was happening. Jeremiah tells Zedekiah, you're going to meet the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, face to face one day. Now, the thing about it, remember Jeremiah, I mean, not Jeremiah, Zedek when Zedekiah did meet Nebuchadnezzar, guess what? He was blind, but they did meet eye to eye, even though he couldn't see him. They were eye to eye. So, it also talked about in this chapter, well... When the Babylonians were, you know, encroaching upon them, they got afraid. And what do we do when we get afraid? We repent. Oh, God, please, I'll just do whatever you want me to do. And so the Jews had been having indentured slaves that were also Jews. They were supposed to let them be free every after, after six years. Well, they weren't doing that. So all of a sudden, they're like, we're ready. They're going to free them all. So they did. And then when uh, the Babylonians had to stop encroaching upon them to go fight Egypt for a little bit, they went right back to what they were supposed to be doing again, being disobedient. And then uh, we skip over to chapter 37, and it talks about Jerusalem's last days. Jeremiah gets in prison, and then Jeremiah is summoned by Zedekiah. And so what you end up happen, happening is um, Zedekiah was a puppet used by Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is kind of the one that put Zedekiah in office. He actually had a whole nother name and Nebuchadnezzar changed his name to Zedekiah. All right. Jeremiah gets in prison on a lie. They lie about, you know, you're a part of this uh, treason or what, what's going on. And so he ends up being in prison. And so Zedekiah, instead of acting like a king and doing the right thing, he was like, I don't, I mean, I don't know what to do. So he was scary. So Zedekiah sends for Jeremiah undercover. He didn't want the people to know that he sent for him, but he understood that Jeremiah, you know, was a uh, prophet of the Lord. So I was like, okay. Then 38, Jeremiah gets thrown into a cistern. All right. And Zedekiah has his final meeting with Jeremiah. Now, what happened is Ebed-Melech, was one of Jeremiah's friends, and he was like, listen, king, he went and met with the king, he was like, they put him in a cistern, this is what's happening, you know, he doesn't have any food, I think we should at least get him out, and so they did, the king sends for him, and Jeremiah tells the king again, if you submit to defeat under Babylonians, then you're going to survive, but if you don't, you won't, you won't at all, okay, and so they end up letting uh, Jeremiah, instead of being put back in the cistern, he was still in prison, but it wasn't in the cistern. And then 39, guess what? Fall of Jerusalem to Babylon. All right. Jeremiah gets freed by the Nebuchadnezzar. So it was the ninth year, 10th month of King Zedekiah's rule. Babylonians breached the walls, got the walls down. Only a few poor people, very poor people, would be allowed to stay. All right. Jeremiah was going to be returned to his home. And guess what? They took him there. Isn't that something? Isn't that how God will do you? The people came, took over the city, burning everything down. And then they turned around 
and take Jeremiah to his home. And then Jeremiah sends a word to Ebed Melech that he would be spared in spite, God said, in spite of all the stuff, you're going to see the death and all the destruction around you, but guess what? I'm going to spare you. And then we, uh, we jump all the way to the end of Jeremiah, which is chapter 52. Okay. And it was a, they, you know, recap the fall of Jerusalem and how Jeho Jehoiakim gets pardoned. So this chapter is mostly about to show you how Jeremiah's prophecies came true. And then how Jehoiakim gets uh, pardoned and he gets to come back. And what this ends up doing, people don't even realize how sovereign God is being behind the scenes. But what this does is this secures the Davidic lineage for Jesus. Because this is how Mary comes through. Mary gets attached through this lineage. Okay. And so 2 Kings 24 and 25 really kind of goes over a lot of the stuff that we just, that Jeremiah prophesied about, prophesied about, okay? Judas kings, the deportation to Babylon, um, Zedekiah, Nebuchadnezzar, the siege of Jerusalem, how Jerusalem got destroyed. And then 2 Chronicles 36, we talk about all, they go through the, the list of Judas kings all the way to Zedekiah. And it talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, the decree of Cyrus, who was going to be the Persian king, who was going to end up taking over Babylon so that people could come back. So that's what happened with that. So I said, for me, I said, Lord, remind me that there is nothing too hard for you, God. My question for you is, you do know that God tied himself to his promises. And the only way to fail is if he ceases to be God. So when God ties himself to, him, to his promises, the only way he could possibly fail is that he ceases to be God. Isn't that something? That's the God we serve. And then Psalm 79, faith amid confusion. These are some lines I pulled out. God of our salvation, help us for the glory of your name. Rescue us. Atone us for our sins. For your name's sake. Why should the nations ask? Where is their God? And then Psalms 126, Zion's restoration. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Then our tongues with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. And then we get to James, New Testament, chapters 4 and 5. And um, chapter 4, James talks about the proud or humble our will, and God's will. And he reminds us that worldly attachment is rooted in pride and will always be opposed by God. The king of pride is Satan. Taking responsibility and confessing sin as sin. Okay, when you take responsibility and then you confess your sin as sin, that's what is called humility. That's when you're being humble. All right? And then life just has too many variables. For you to guarantee your tomorrow. So when you start talking, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this in my future. Okay, too many variables in life for you to guarantee that. So it's always, you know, if God's will, then I will. James 5, warning to the rich, waiting for the Lord, truthful speech and effective prayer. Okay, so it's not about the money, but it's about the money becoming a God. That's, that's the warning to the rich. All right. And then it's about patience, being like a farmer when it comes to patience. Because the, the farmer is still working while he's waiting on the harvest, but he's still working. He didn't plant the seeds, go up on the porch and just say, okay, the harvest going to come. All right. And when you have a yes or yay or nay, yes or no. All right. Make sure that you're not doing it trying to try and convince somebody. If you got to convince somebody that your yes is yes or that your no is no, hmm. All right. And then here's a big one from James 5. This is so important. Prayer, your prayer can snatch a person from a physical or spiritual death. Isn't that something? Your prayer has a power to do that. And then we get to 1 Peter chapter 1. It talks about a living hope and a call to holy living. Our salvation was the new birth into a living hope. Trials do three things 
When you have trials in your life, there's three things. All right. It's proving your faith, developing your faith, or glorifying God. Could be a combination of more than one, but it's at least one of those is happening. Your love, you love Christ by seeking his glory. You trust Christ by obeying him. So when you seek his glory, that's you showing that you love him. When you obey him, that's showing that you trust him. And then the perfect holiness of God is at the heart, the base of all the rest of his attributes. And then 1 Peter 2 talks about the living stone and a holy people, a call to good works. The word that calls you to be born again also causes your growth. So that word gave you salvation. That same word will cause you to grow. Some Christians choose malnourishment, okay, because they don't have a steady diet of the word. They're choosing malnourishment. All right. God takes living stones. That's you and I as the church. And he's building a spiritual house, not spiritual houses, a one spiritual house. We are the living stones that goes with it. All right. God's uh, no, mm, Christian's job is to make a difference for God in this world, the one you're living in. So go public with your faith and influence those around you like salt and light. And then 1 Peter chapter 3 was about wives and husbands doing no evil and undeserved suffering. And here's, here's, this is the best way to sum up that wives and husbands. Wives be submissive, submit, submissive, husband be sacrificial. If you got a husband being sacrificial like Jesus is for the church, you, you shouldn't mind submitting. All right. The church should be known by how they love one another. That's how people should know us as a church, how we love one another. Not the church you're building. Modus, church, you, me, us. And then Christ is the basis of spiritual baptism. I said, Lord, remind me that the church is like an embassy in a foreign land. It's where the rules and ethics of eternity operate within history. Isn't that something? I love that. And then I said, you do know that worldliness and godliness cannot coexist. That's my question for you. So those were our travels for last week. Let's see where we're going next week. We're going to do Jeremiah 43, 44, and then 47 through 51. I think we're going to end, finish up chapter Jeremiah. I mean, the book of Jeremiah next week. We're going to do the book of Lamentations, all of it. The book of Obadiah, all of it. We're going to do Psalms 137, 147, and 80. We're going to finish up 1 Peter 4 and 5, and then we're going to do 2 Peter 1 through 3. We're knocking them out. Y'all, this is week 41. We have like literally 11 of these left. And then we'll be done. And as difficult and hard as it has been for me to make sure I'm, you know, writing notes enough and streamlining, streamlining them down to do this and timing and all the things. I'm actually looking forward to what God wants to do next year. At first, I was a little struggling. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. But now I'm kind of ready. So thanks for traveling with me. Happy travels for next week. Bye.